Recall that in order to develop an explanation for the photoelectric effect, Einstein suggested that light acts like a particle. The Bohr model of the atom is still quite crude, and in order to rationalize Bohr's first postulate, there needed to be another intuitive leap. Enter de Broglie. He suggested that matter can also exhibit wave-like properties. This provides a nice symmetry in nature, and he argued that both matter and light obey the equation lambda is equal to h over p, where lambda is the wavelength and p is the momentum of the object. So let's see what matter acting as waves looks like in practice. So this first example calculates the de Broglie wavelength of a puck traveling at 40 meters per second, which is about 90 miles an hour. And so to do so, we'll start with de Broglie's relationship where he said the wavelength of, of the wave is equal to Planck's constant divided by its momentum. And we're going to recall that the momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So all I will do is just sub in all these numbers. The wavelength is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. That I'm going to divide by the mass of the puck, 0 0.17 kilograms, times 40 meters per second. And the number that we're going to get out of this is 9.74 times 10 to the minus 35 meters, which is a completely undetectable number. Such a small inconsequential wavelength, this is something that we cannot measure. And this is one of the reasons why we don't notice this in everyday life, is that the objects that we interact with in everyday life would have a wavelength so small that we would not be able to, to measure with the most precise measurement tools. So let's look at an example now where, where the de Broglie wavelength of that particle actually matters. So here we have the second question where we're going to calculate the de Broglie wavelength of an electron traveling at 1% of the speed of light, where the speed of light is 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So that means that the speed of the electron in this case is going to be equal to 1% of that value, 2.998 times 10 to the 8. And so that means it's traveling at 2.998 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. We can then calculate the momentum of this particle. That's just mass times velocity. The mass of the electron, 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. We're going to multiply that by its speed, 2.998 times 10 to the 6. That means its momentum is 2.73 times 10 to the minus 24 kilograms meters per second. And then we can calculate the de Broglie wavelength. Lambda is equal to h over momentum, Planck's constant divided by momentum. That's 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 divided by 2.73 times 10 to the minus 24, and so the value is 2.43 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, or 2.43 picometers. So you can see that there's a huge difference in terms of the, the wavelength that's measured here for this electron traveling at 1% of the speed of light relative to the puck traveling at 40 meters per second. And the big thing that I want you to notice is that this distance here, this 2.43 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, that's, that's of atomic dimensions. So that's definitely something that we can measure. So we can certainly see wave-like properties in electrons traveling at high speeds. A wavelength of 243 picometers is in the X-ray region of the electromagnetic spectrum. A comparison of the wave-like nature of electrons with X-rays is shown here in this slide. The image on the left is the diffraction pattern from X-rays, while the one on the right is that from electrons. The similarity of behavior between the two demonstrates that electrons and other particles act like waves under certain situations. Let's discuss what this means for the Bohr model of the atom. Recall Bohr's first postulate. The electron can only revolve around the nucleus in certain allowed orbits. If the particle is a wave, then it must match up with itself. Hence, 2 pi r must equal to 
n lambda, meaning the circumference of the orbit must equal to an integer multiple of the wavelength. And the wave must match up with itself so that the wave in that orbit is stable. The image on the right illustrates this point. The top left image shows when the circumference of the circle, 2 pi r, is equal to an integer multiple of the wavelength, hence the wave matches up. In the other three pictures, the circumference is not an integer multiple of the wavelength. Therefore, the wave does not match up, and these orbits are not allowed. Substituting in the de Broglie relation, lambda is equal to h over momentum, yields the angular momentum, mvr, is equal to nh over 2 pi, which was Bohr's postulate. So, the reason the electron can only revolve around the nucleus in certain allowed orbits, where each orbit represents a stationary energy state that does not radiate energy, is because the electron is acting like a standing wave and can perpetually remain in that state. The fact that particles can act like waves provided a physical rationale for Bohr's first postulate. The final topic covered here is the uncertainty principle. The wave-particle duality of light and matter affect our ability to make precise measurements. For instance, say we want to measure the position of an electron to within a small uncertainty. To see the electron, we shine light on it. However, that light carries a momentum that upon colliding with the electron changes the electron's momentum. In the mid-1920s, German physicist Werner Heisenberg showed that it was impossible to measure the momentum transferred to the electron. Therefore, if one wanted to know the position of the electron to within delta x, then there would also be an uncertainty to knowing the momentum delta p. The relationship between the two is delta x times delta p is greater than or equal to h, being Planck's constant. Note that this uncertainty is not due to poor measurement. It is a fundamental property of how the act of measuring sometimes changes the properties of what is measured. As we will see later, the uncertainty principle will fall out naturally from our analysis of quantum mechanics. The following two examples, however, demonstrate the numerical consequences of the uncertainty principle. So again, let's see where the Heisenberg uncertainty um, occurs in practice where we actually might see it in practice. So the first example here is calculate the uncertainty of the position of a puck traveling at 40 meters per second if we can measure its velocity to a precision of 4 times 10 to the minus 7 meters per second. So what that means is that the uncertainty in the velocity, sorry, not the position, but the velocity is 4 times 10 to the minus 7. And so if we're going to be using the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to measure, to understand this relationship, then what we're saying is delta x times delta p is equal to h, and this is going to tell us the minimum uncertainty. Well, then we need to find out what is the uncertainty in the momentum of the puck. But that's just going to be equal to the mass of the puck times delta v in this case. So the mass of the puck is 0 0.17 kilograms. The precision that we know, the velocity, is 4 times 10 to the minus 7. So pretty precise knowledge of the precision of, of the speed of the puck, and that gives us a value of the precision of the momentum that we know to be 6.8 times 10 to the minus 8. That means I can take that value and plug that into the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I'm going to rearrange. Delta x is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. I'm going to divide that by the 6.8 times 10 to the minus 8. In the end, I can know the precision of the puck to 9.74 times 10 to the minus 27 meters. So this is an unbelievably small number. So this means that in our everyday lives, when we deal with actual objects, we could know its, its speed and its momentum to a very precise value, and that we can still know the, the, its position to a very precise value. And this is something that I really enjoy, because as a fan of hockey, I want my players to be able to shoot the puck, and I want my goalies to be able to stop the puck. And to know that, they need to know exactly where the puck is. And here we're showing that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle doesn't apply in that case because the objects are so large. And again, so in everyday life, we don't necessarily see this effect in practice. Now let's see an example where, where this does matter. And so we're going to go to the microscopic world again. What we're going to do is we're going to look at 
the uncertainty in the velocity of an electron, which has a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, and we're going to find out when its position can be measured to a precision of 50 picometers. So that means then that my delta x in this case is going to be equal to 50 picometers, which is 50 times 10 to the minus 12 meters, because pico is times 10 to the minus 12. I'm going to start from the same starting point. I'm going to say delta x times delta p is equal to Planck's constant. Again, I'm finding the minimum uncertainty, which is why I can write the equal sign. I rearrange for the momentum. And so that means then that I get Planck's constant 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. I'm going to divide that by delta x, which is 50 times 10 to the minus 12. And so the number I get out of this is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 23 kilograms meters per second. Recall also that the momentum or the uncertainty in the momentum can be related to the uncertainty in the velocity by saying that it's equal to the mass of the electron times the uncertainty of the velocity. That means then I can take this 1.3 times 10 to the minus 23, and I can let that equal to the mass of the electron, 9.11, times 10 to the minus 31, times delta V. That means then the precision to which I can know the speed of my electron, if I want to know its position to 50 picometers, is going to be equal to 1.4 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Now this is a very, very large number. And to put this into perspective, recall that the speed of light is 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So if I want to find the percentage with which this precision is in relation to the speed of light, I'm going to divide 1.4 times 10 to the 7, divide that by 2.998 times 10 to the 8 times 100%. And this ends up being 4.7%. So I can know, if I want to know this precise location of where my electron lives but to within 50 picometers, I cannot know its speed to within almost 5% of the speed of light. So you can start to imagine that if we're dealing with experiments with electrons that are traveling very fast or we need to know where these electrons live and we need to know a very fine precision to to either their position or their speed, you can imagine that there starts to become very large trade-offs in terms of how well we can measure either. And again, this has nothing to do with our ability to make the measurement. This has everything to do with the fact that we have something where in the inherent act of measuring, we perturb the system. And this is something that is just inherent in all measurements. It's just when we look at it in the, the macroscopic scale, when we look at things that are in everyday life, like pucks or tables or chairs or people, the, these uncertainties end up being very, very, very small, or they can be very small because the masses are so large. But when we're looking at very small objects, since the masses are so small, we end up getting very large trade-offs in terms of how well we can precisely measure things. We covered a lot in this lecture. To summarize, Spectroscopy is a measurement technique where the light emitted by an atom or molecule is analyzed in order to determine its composition and properties. Back at the beginning of the 20th century, there was still no good explanation as to the origin of the light emitted by atoms. The modernization of the atom, or of the model of the atom, provided an explanation for these spectra. At the time, the hydrogen atom was quantified empirically by the Rydberg equation. The theoretical underpinnings of these observations were developed first by Rutherford, where he said atoms were akin to solar systems with small, massive, positive cores with electrons orbiting them. Bohr then added that there must be quantized angular momentum of the electrons traveling in these orbits and requiring that the energy is only emitted or absorbed as light when the electrons change orbits. And finally, de Broglie added that matter exhibits wave-like properties which explains how Bohr's postulates were true. Finally, the last thing we covered in this lecture is that the wave-particle duality also affects the act of measuring things, which is quantified by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle.